I'll start with a little bit of a history of how vegetarian and vegan movements emerged. That will give background into my own research on vegetarianism, veganism, and animal rights movements in France and the United States. And that will provide a platform for understanding what I'll end with, which are some insights from market researchers on vegetarians, vegans, and their food choices. So I'll give you some tips for how to market vegan foods and plant-based foods in ways that people will actually um, you know, purchase it, which I think is ultimately your goal. So like Charles said at the very beginning of the talk um, or of this entire event, this isn't really a trend that's going to go away in a few years. I think he had marked it as 10 plus. What I'm going to show you is that this is something that's been happening for decades, even over a century. So this is something that I think will continue to grow and that people will you know, be paying attention to for quite some time. So without further ado, we'll go back in time to the 19th and early 20th century. So first, how did veganism emerge? It grew out of early vegetarian movements in the US, the UK, and in France which is where I've conducted actually um, a lot of my ethnography I meant to mention earlier. Vegetarian societies grew in the United States in the 1800s and early 1900s, especially with the newfound interest in natural diets. Sylvester Graham, a temperance lecturer, promoted vegetarianism as part of his broader-based health reform movement. The first gathering of the American Vegetarian Society in New York City in 1850 included a variety of dietary reformers who promoted meatless diets, including physicians, social reformers, Grahamites, and Bible Christians, which was one of the first proto-vegetarian groups in the United States. John Harvey Kellogg continues Graham's work into the early 20th century at the Battle Creek Sanitarium, which some of you may know from the film The Road to Wellville. During the World Wars, vegetarian and animal protection societies suffered. Food rationing forced citizens to be partially vegetarian, but the nutritional quality of the food wasn't adequate enough to nourish. A diet without meat represented austerity and bleakness. No one wanted to be reminded of the wars, and eating meat was a prime way to return to nutritional prosperity. The 19th century vegetarian movement in France was not promoted by temperance advocates, but by anarchists. These naturist anarchists practiced vegetarianism and veganism for health and animal protection reasons. With about 50 vegetarian restaurants in Paris between the world wars, the vegetarian movement was stronger in France then than it was now. Further strengthening this early vegetarian movement was the 1953 founding of the Association Végétarienne de France. But why isn't vegetarianism enough? Many people, including vegetarians, might argue that since animals aren't killed for their meat or eggs, that vegetarianism should be sufficient. So just as a brief definition, in case anyone is not so familiar with veganism, it typically refers to a diet without any animal products. So no meat, no dairy products, no eggs. Ethical vegans, like those that I've interviewed for my research in the United States and in France, also avoid animal products and other elements of their daily lifestyle, like clothing or personal care products, um, any typical products that you might use in your day-to-day -day activities. So vegans seek to avoid all uses of animals, but returning to this question of why isn't vegetarian enough, they also point out that since cows must be impregnated to give milk, and then the cows go on to, get to slaughter as veal, the dairy industry does kill animals. Similarly, since male chicks are killed shortly after birth because they don't produce eggs, the egg industry also kills animals. So the Vegan Society in England claims that as early as 1909, the ethics of consuming dairy products was hotly debated within the vegetarian movement. This is why, in August of 1944, Elsie Shrigley and Donald Watson began coordinating non-dairy vegetarians for a new group. And in November of 1944, they founded the world's first vegan society in Leicester. Watson took the word vegan from the first three and the last two letters of vegetarian. The contemporary animal rights movement grew out of these vegetarian and vegan movements, and they were aided by academic philosophers who developed ethical arguments for animal rights. 
The first iterations of these arguments came in the 1970s when philosophers argued that animals are deserving of our moral and ethical consideration. In Peter Singer's utilitarian approach, he argued that since animals are sentient beings and can suffer just like humans, they have a right to avoid unnecessary suffering at humans' hands. Philosopher Tom Reagan focused on the moral status of animals and argued that animals, like humans, have consciousness, needs, desires, and a sense of the future. Animals are inherently worthy as living creatures, Reagan said, and should never be used as resources. The 1990s brought more critique on the idea of animals as commodities. Focusing on the property status of animals, legal scholar Gary Francione argued that laws encouraging humane treatment do little to actually protect animals so long as humans still consider animals to be commodities. Francione believes that the most important thing that humans can do for animals is to become vegan, thus living abolition in their everyday lives. Ecofeminist scholar Carol Adams linked the oppression of women and the oppression of animals. Adams argues that both women and animals are absent reference, meaning that animals' literal beings disappear when people eat meat, just like women's individual selves metaphorically disappear when women are treated like a piece of meat. Adams' scholarship also informs the development of anti-speciesism as a movement. Our last philosophical venture. Anti-speciesism attempts to link human rights and animal rights. The term speciesism was originally coined by British philosopher Richard Ryder in an animal rights pamphlet in 1970, and it was first popularly used by um, Peter Singer in Animal Liberation in 1975, but the application of the concept to the animal rights movement primarily occurs in France. David Olivier, one of the founders of the anti-speciesist movement, defined speciesism in a 1992 article as follows. Speciesism is to species what racism is to race and what sexism is to sex. A discrimination based on species, almost always in favor of members of the human species. Despite philosophers' calls for veganism to be an integral part of animal rights, the first wave of contemporary animal rights activists largely focused on fur, hunting, and animal testing. Celebrities jumped on people for the ethical treatment of animals, I'd rather go naked than wear fur campaign, and activists attacked these issues because they considered them to be the most egregious and unnecessary forms of animal exploitation. We get a lot of our stereotypes of animal rights activists and vegans from this early animal rights movement. You might have a stereotype of an annoying vegan or a strident animal rights activist making demands of others. Luckily, the vegan movement actively discourages this kind of approach. The vegans who come into your businesses just want to be able to find food options that align with their ethical approach to consumption. So let's put their contemporary approach into context. The second wave of contemporary animal rights activism distinguished itself from the earlier movement in that this new wave of activists focus on promoting legislation for protecting animals, but they also encourage people to make changes in their own lifestyles to reduce animal suffering through vegetarianism and veganism. For the first time, vegetarianism, veganism, and animal protection all merged into one movement. This newfound focus was due in part to the ever-expanding industrialized animal agriculture, also known as factory farms. This is the setting in which I conducted my research on contemporary vegans and vegan animal rights activists in France and the United States. Since the 1960s, farmed animal production has greatly increased. Milk production has doubled, meat production has tripled, and egg production has quadrupled. By the 1980s, farmed animals comprised fully 99% of all animals killed by humans each year. All of this production also affects the environment. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations calculates that cattle are the world's fifth largest source of methane. Cows alone are the world's third largest greenhouse gas emitter. And with the recent IPCC report on climate change, more people are paying attention to the carbon footprint of the foods that they eat. So now I'd like to present some of my findings from interviews with and observations of vegans. Charles asked me to speak about the social and cultural reasons behind why people are vegan, and I want to do that through my participants' voices, through some interview quotes with them. So why are they vegan? 
For the ethical vegans that I interviewed for my research, by far the primary reason behind their veganism was animal rights. They viewed their veganism as a way of putting their beliefs in animal rights into practice, as one interviewee said. Because I was involved in the animal rights movement, for me it's a necessity. If I'm going to be representing animals in a credible way, I cannot be eating them, killing them, or supporting factory farming. I always knew that, even when I went vegetarian, that veganism was going to be the ultimate goal. I felt I could not be in the animal rights movement and be legitimate without being vegan. I knew I was still contributing to animal suffering as long as I was still eating eggs and dairy or wearing leather. In addition to animal rights reasons, environmentalism was another reason behind my participants' veganism, as another one put it. There's the whole system of what it takes to have factory farms. You have McDonald's cutting down rainforest in Brazil to make grazing land. It's just an ecological nightmare. All the grains that could feed the world are going to feed animals in factory farms. Why would you waste 100 pounds of grain to get one, grain, one pound of meat? It makes no sense. His response highlights another reason for veganism, ending world hunger. Many of the vegans that I interviewed and many vegans and vegan and animal rights organizations tout veganism as playing a role in ending world hunger. As you just heard, we already produce enough food to feed the entire world, and the root cause of hunger is primarily a problem of distribution and not a problem of production. But the fact that 36% of the calories produced in crops go to feed farmed animals instead of humans, and when those animals are killed for meat, only 12% of those calories make their way into the human diet as meat, we're losing two-thirds the number of calories that would have been available to humans if humans just ate the grain in the first place. A tertiary reason for veganism was human health. However, most of the vegans that I interviewed saw health as more of a bonus effect of their veganism and not as a motivating force in and of itself, as one interviewee put it. Veganism is more of a conscious lifestyle, so you're more aware of what you're putting in your body. You can be a vegan and just eat potato chips. Vegan doesn't equate with healthy, although I had a checkup and the doctor did a blood profile and said, you're one of the healthiest people I've ever seen. The nearly 100 vegans that I interviewed said animal rights was the primary reason behind their veganism, followed closely by the environment, then world hunger, and lastly, their own health. Their reasons were moral and ethical, seeking to improve the lives of animals, the lives of other people, and the environment in which they all lived. If the doctor said to them, you're so healthy, it was more of a bonus effect rather than something that motivated their veganism in the first place. So, just how many vegans are there? Overall, the number increases from year to year. In the United Kingdom in 2016, surveys showed that just over 1% of the population identified as vegan and just over twice that identified as vegetarian. But a new 2018 survey claims to have found a huge growth with 7% of the population identifying as vegan and 14% identifying as vegetarian. We see similar trends in the United States. A recent poll showed that 6% of people in the U.S. identified as vegan in 2017 in comparison to 1% in 2014. But those numbers can be a bit misleading because studies also show that people who identify as vegan don't always follow a vegan diet. Depending upon how the survey questions are asked, the numbers change. If researchers ask about food practices, we see a difference between identity and practice. One survey asked respondents to report everything they ate during a two-day period, and about 60% of people who identified as vegetarian reported eating meat. Only about 1% of the population that self-identified as vegetarian also reported never eating meat during that same time period. But that number still has increased since 2003. So, like Dominic had mentioned earlier, veganism is cool. People want to identify as vegan. So what we've learned from these surveys is that more people are eating plant-based foods and more people want to identify as vegetarian or vegan, even if they're not fully embodying that. So we have what are known as flexitarians. The number of people avoiding meat and animal products is still increasing. Other surveys show that fully one in five Britons is reducing the amount of meat that they eat, and when you include vegetarians and vegans in that number, one-third of Britons have either fully stopped or have reduced eating meat. So, how do people become vegan, and what helps them stay vegan? 
These are some of the motivating questions behind my sociological research on vegans. Lifestyle change requires conscious deliberation and it proceeds very gradually. Participating in a lifestyle movement like veganism is less about attending a protest than it is about changing one's everyday behavior. The iterative process of consuming new information and reflecting upon it to then go about changing one's identity and everyday living habits is how people come to change their entire lifestyles. So once they learned new information about veganism, many of the vegans that I interviewed had a catalytic experience. Each of these moments centered on animal rights, realizing the meat they were eating came from an animal, learning what goes into a hamburger, or learning how animals die from the meat and dairy industry. My interviewees experienced a transformation of consciousness in which they understood the concept of animal rights for the first time. One vegan I interviewed described the moment he understood animal rights, which occurred after listening to a punk album. He said, I listened to one band called Shelter, and they were all Hare Krishna devotees. And at the end of their albums, they would have their spiritual masters giving speeches on subjects related to Krishna consciousness. And on one of their albums, they were talking about the reasons why they were vegetarian. Even though I don't have any religious beliefs, just the interconnectedness of equating animal life with human life, the basic value of life really clicked. Through these processes of having a catalytic experience, learning about veganism and animal rights, and sharing these stories and these moments with other people, the vegans that I interviewed transformed their identities and behaviors. Once people become vegan, how do they stay vegan? My research shows that social support from family and friends and from their broader social networks is key to maintaining a vegan diet and lifestyle. Families don't always welcome other family members' adoption of a vegetarian or vegan diet. And this conflict comes in a variety of ways. It can be parents responding negatively to their children's dietary change, children responding negatively to their parents' dietary change, or partners and spouses responding negatively to the other partners or spouse dietary change. But not all families react negatively. Studies have shown that gradual transitions to vegetarianism or veganism within a family ease the period of adjustment. Most of the vegans that I interviewed became vegetarian and vegan once they moved out of their familial home and away from their parents. But they still needed support for their new diet and lifestyle, which they found through their friends. Vegan social networks provide participants with cultural tools that inform their vegan practice. These close-knit social networks share knowledge and resources on how to maintain their veganism. Another vegan I interviewed described the importance of a supportive social network when becoming vegan and helping his friends stay vegan. He said, when I finally decided I was going to be vegan, I talked to one of my friends, and he was vegetarian at the time, and we were like, we should be vegan. We really need to do it. We made a pact to go vegan, like, let's do it. We're going to do it. So we did it, and a couple of our friends who were being slack on being vegan, we were like, come on, you have to do it. And they followed a little bit later. So it was a personal decision, but I guess it probably wasn't at first. I mean, it helps to do it in a group. Not letting other people think for you, but it's easier if you have a support system. This is very much like what Jamie was talking about earlier when he participated in Veganuary. It's an entire social network of other people trying veganism out for you. And just like an earlier version of what Jamie was talking about with social media, um, I'll talk a little bit about the DIY social media before the internet and then how the internet plays a role. So several of my interviewees participated in the do-it-yourself or DIY punk subculture, which provided social support for their veganism through political song lyrics and through participation in the subculture it shows. So DIY punk shows often begin with a vegan potluck, after which the band sings songs about animal rights and veganism, after which they sell merchandise and distribute information about veganism and animal rights. In the 1990s, many of these punk vegans created cookzines, or DIY recipe books, where each recipe suggests a particular um, punk or hardcore album to listen to while cooking the vegan dish. Outside of the DIY punk subculture, several of my interviewees found friends for, that they met in natural food cooperatives, in their yoga studios, in their classes at university, while working at a vegan restaurant, or especially through activism. You know, that face-to-face -face interaction was very important for them. 
But beyond face-to-face -face interaction and support from friends, many vegans learn about veganism and find support for it through the internet and social media. While traditional media representations of vegans are often negative, vegans use social media to celebrate and spread veganism. As a response to the question, what do vegans eat anyway? Vegans created the hashtag, what vegans eat, which shares um, mouth-watering images of beautiful vegan foods on Instagram. Studies show that now about half of all new vegans learn about veganism through social media. They also learn how to be vegan, how to eat, how to cook, where to shop, where they can go out to eat, what restaurants are vegan friendly, what stores they should go to. Several celebrated vegan cookbook authors and chefs also got their start on vegan blogs, which continue to share recipes and tips for new vegans. So now in this final section of my presentation, I wanna share some of this new research on vegetarians, vegans, and meat reducers, as well as some market information about their grocery and restaurant habits. How can you sell items that people will buy whether they identify as vegan or not? Earlier, I showed statistics that demonstrate that more people are eating plant-based foods and more people want to identify as vegetarian or vegan regardless of their individual dietary practices. So whether your diner is a hardcore vegan or someone who simply aspires to be vegan, the bottom line is that more people are eating plant-based foods. According to Baum and Whiteman, international food and restaurant consultants, the number one food trend of the year 2018 is plant-based foods. They found that 31% of Americans practice meat-free days, 35% of Americans get most of their protein from sources other than red meat, 83% of U.S. consumers are adding plant-based foods to their diet to improve health and nutrition. 58% of adults drink non-dairy milk. Walmart is pleading with its suppliers to increase their production of plant-based food products. And Google reports a 90% increase in the number of vegan searches every year or in the past year. So for those of you in the food and restaurant purveyor business, this means you have a huge new market. How will you reach that market? Providing plant-based foods will be increasingly important for meals prepared at home. One reason why families can react negatively to vegetarianism or veganism is because meat is traditionally seen as the center of a proper home-cooked meal. While many vegans may center vegetables or legumes in their meals, the rise of plant-based plant meat substitutes allows for traditional home-cooked meals to become vegetarian or vegan. In the protein market, plant-based meat substitutes are set to reach $5.2 billion by the year 2020 and are predict predicted to make up one-third of the entire market for proteins by the year 2054. Plant-based milks are also on the rise. The global plant-based milk market is expected to reach $16 billion in 2018, up from $7 billion in 2010. And here in the UK, Waitrose introduced a range of vegan food in 2017, expanded that selection by 60% in 2018, and says that sales of vegan and vegetarian foods in July 2018 were 70% above the level they were in July 2017. Tesco's Wicked Healthy line of vegan meals launched in January of 2018, and they sold 4 million vegan meals in only 33 weeks, breaking their sales projections. Even food delivery for meals at home is seeing an increase in vegan orders. According to the food delivery service Just Eat, they also predict that veganism is the food trend of 2018, having seen a 94% increase in vegan foods ordered since 2017. How will restaurants cater to this growing market? Having a variety of options, including fully vegan or veganizable options, is a must. But according to food studies researchers, there are some other tricks to getting vegetarian and vegan items to sell. One group of researchers experimented with the naming of vegetarian dishes in a university cafeteria. Sometimes the dishes had generic names like beets or bok choy and mushrooms. Other times they gave the dishes exciting and indulgent names like dynamite chili and tangy lime seasoned beets or tangy ginger bok choy and bonsai shiitake mushrooms. 25% more people selected the vegetarian dishes on the days when they had the exciting and indulgent names. 
Why is this the case? Other researchers have found that if a dish sounds too healthy, people will rate its tastiness lower than if they believe a dish is not healthy. Even people who say they like healthy food will rate foods they believe to be unhealthy as tastier than foods they believe to be healthy. So one takeaway here is just label your vegetarian and vegan dishes sumptuously. The Humane League, an animal rights organization in the United States, conducted a survey with 800 omnivore participants in which they asked participants to rate 21 dishes in terms of appeal. The least appealing dishes were all just a meat substitute, like here is a tofu scramble, here is a vegan sausage. The highest rated meals were familiar meals that didn't necessarily contain a meat substitute, like roasted potatoes or beans and rice or vegetable lo mein. Their findings could be explained by other studies that showed that people rate meat substitutes higher if they think the meat substitute fits well with the dish or other studies that showed that people are more likely to accept an unfamiliar food if it's served with familiar foods that are already a part of their diet. So the takeaway here is don't do this. Don't just place a slab of tofu in the middle of a plate. Include meat substitutes as part of familiar dishes. And finally, how might you incorporate vegan foods into your menu? One study found that people were less likely to order vegetarian meals when they were placed in a separate vegetarian section of the menu. Instead, they ordered the vegetarian meals at more than twice the rate when they were placed in the regular section of the menu and simply marked as vegetarian or vegan. On that note, another study recommends avoiding using the terms vegan or vegetarian in the actual name of a dish and instead using a subtle V or VG to mark a dish as vegetarian or vegan. One way to do this and make more money is to have the default configuration of dishes like pasta or salads be vegan and then charge the consumer more to add animal-based protein if they like. So I hope that I've provided um, some understanding behind the social and cultural reasons behind why people become vegan and why they stay vegan. And I hope that I've provided some useful information on catering to vegan crowds. No matter their motivations or their identity, more people are eating plant-based foods. And by providing vegan and veganizable foods, you can be at the forefront of this eco-friendly, animal-friendly, and health-friendly market. Thank you.